You know, yeah, church is a little different here, but what is church? Church is not a building with, you know, so many songs and this and that. And church is you and me. Church is people that have been called out to walk for Jesus Christ. Amen. And that's what you need to realize and you need to see. And it, is it easy? No, it, it's not. It's hard. Especially when, you know, do we look at others that partake in things and judge them? Absolutely not. Man, we love them. And pray that, you know, God would pull them out of what it is um, that they're going through. Or whatever it is. That God, by His Spirit, His Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKadosh, would reveal unto them, you know, because He is the only one that can illuminate our mind. So today, I'm going to, uh, you can write these scriptures down. Um, um, I'm going I'm to teach on how the Holy Spirit, the breath or the wind, or the, the Ruach of God, His Spirit, um, I'm going to teach on Him, talk about how He is our teacher. Okay? Um, and He is the one that illuminates the mind. Now, Charlene had did a little teaching last week that I want to bring to your attention because it was really good to read it to you. And you're going to find out... Um, Zach, will you fix me a little coffee, please? Two cups of sugar at three. Two cups. Two cups. <laughs> anyway, no, Splenda, please. Um, um, Charlene... Uh, did this little thing and gave it to me. I want to read it to you because it's really an eye open. I want you guys to see it, you know. Um, from This is from the meaning of the Dead Sea Scrolls. What does the Dead Sea Scrolls, we know about that was found in the caves of Qumran and, you know, in 1947 and uh, they was found in multiple caves but actually they was, uh, the majority of them was found in, in Cave 4 and uh, we'll get into that later. Um, so James Vander, Van, uh, Vanderkam and Peter Flint wrote about, about it, what they mean. So let's look at it. The foreword for this book was written by Emmanuel Tove, director of the Dead Sea Scrolls Publications Project, Hebrew University of Jerusalem. So this is where it came from. So what does the Dead Sea Scrolls mean? This is very, very important because the Dead Sea Scrolls is the Word of God. Okay. They found uh, the book that the Bible that you have in your hand today. The first 39 books was in the caves of Qumran, almost identically word for word, and that was found in 1947 to prove that the Word of God is authentic, and it hasn't changed. It was compared to the King James version of the Bible, and it was found out to be 99.9 percent .9 accurate with the word that we have today. There was only a slight and the English, the, our English word versus the Aramaic. And so anyway, this book won the Biblical Archaeology Society Book of the Year award in uh, 2002. The Dead Sea Scrolls was discovered in 1947. Interesting info, Charlene writes. Um, the Great Isaiah Scroll and the Temple Scroll was 26 foot long. Now that's pretty, there was two scrolls in that, which is really amazing. So the Dead Sea Scroll and the Isaiah Scroll, and I'm going to give you some further information about this, they were both 26 foot long. Why 26? Well, 26 is the number of Yahweh. Y-A-H-W-E-H. -E Yahweh, his numerical value is 26. It's 13 times 2. 13 is love. It's a witness of God's love, that God is love. So now, 
the Dead Sea Scrolls was 26 foot long, but not only was it, but also was the book of Isaiah 26 foot long. Now, which is really amazing because the book of Isaiah consists of 66 chapters, which if you only had one book out of the whole Bible, Isaiah would be the book that you want because the book of Isaiah is the whole Bible in one book. 66, it's 66 chapters representing the 66 books. Okay? Um, the scroll was 26 foot long. William... On, it's written on 19 separate sheets of parchment, okay? Written on 19 uh, different uh, sheets of parchment. Um, uh, animal DNA expert, ADNA, animal DNA expert, uh, W. Ryder, took samples from the four sample groups of these scrolls. One group, they found out, they did a DNA written you know, a search on, uh, because in the old days they wrote it on animal skins. So think about that. The old covenant applied to your flesh. It's written on scrolls, animal scrolls, skins. The law applies to your flesh. Got it? That's what it means. They took samples, and they found that one group was uh, from the old covenant, which represented the calf, so they used calf skins, and the remaining three other scrolls was found to be written on um, wooled sheepskin, which speaks of the new sacrifice, the new covenant. With me? Yeah. All right. In ancient Judaism, um, let me see what I wrote right here on the side. <coughs> written on skins. Oh, check this out. This is pretty amazing right here. Um, see if I don't jump ahead of my... Yeah. In ancient Judaism, strict requirements were imposed to ensure the purity of the scrolls of the Word of God um, and in which it was written on, the animal skins. All right? The skins used were from um, the herds that were known to their ancestors that were known to their ancestors. So this wasn't any animal they just pulled out somewhere and used it. It had to be of pure breed. Very important. Now you're dealing with the DNA of the animal. Pure. Okay? Josephus in Antiquities uh, 12, 146, uh, suggests that the flocks and the herds were carefully guarded against contamination through crossbreeding. Wow. So only the Word of God can be written on something that is pure. You can't have hot and cold. You understand? That's crossbreeding. God is very picky on where He writes His Word. And I wrote right here, on the Old Covenant, it was written on skins then, but now... The Word of God is literally and physically written in your DNA. That's why it's all about the blood. That's why the abomination that causes desolation and the temple will be destroyed is when the, the, uh, the DNA structure of your body, the mark of the beast, is going to alter your DNA and you're no longer going to be able... Uh, you'll be considered an abomination. Your temple will be an abomination to God. You'll be discarded. The DNA is what it's all about. You understand? The blood. Um, and you could find this in Genesis chapter 13, uh, verse 5 through 9. It confirms um, this about the importance of the animals. In Genesis 13, we find out about Abraham and Lot. Remember, Lot chose to go someplace. He looked at the, the Jordan and he said, I'm going to take my herds. The herdsmen were fighting over the cattle. Right? And they couldn't bring them together. They couldn't crossbreed because it's of Abraham the seed came. Lot was from Abraham's brother and he shows the contamination. He goes off into Sodom and Gomorrah. Right? So there had to be a separation of the herds, separating the sheep. Right? And we see it again with Jacob and Laban. Remember, Jacob works for Laban for seven years for Rachel. But he gets Leah, then he works another seven years for Rachel, then he works another seven years for cattle. And then Jacob separates the cattle from the pure that didn't have any markings to the speckled and spotted. 
And he did it during the breeding process, the DNA. Most important, the blood. Um, uh, the Qumran community. Now, I went there in Israel. I went to the community of the Qumran. They're the ones that wrote the word, and, and I'm going to read it to you. It was pretty amazing. That's where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found uh, in Qumran. And, um, so anyway, the Qumran community, committee labored in earnestly. The Qumran committee, committee labored earnestly and continually at the task of explaining the scriptures because of their meaning. They labored. We need in the rule of our committee, we need this in the rule of our committee. Realize how important the word of God was to them that they labored at showing the people what the word really meant. They knew something was in there. It meant something. They labored to find out what it was that they were reading. It was all about Jesus Christ. And they labored to find out what that was. And they had no idea. But they labored at it. They examined the Word. They, they scrutinized it. They did everything they possibly can to draw out of it everything they possibly could to find out what it was actually. What was God really saying? In any place, um, in any place uh, where is gathered... Um, let me go back. Let's see. There would be, uh, there was ten men. And out of the ten men, someone must always be engaged in the study of the law. Day and night, continually, each one taking his turn. The general members um, will be diligent together for the first third of every night of the year reading out loud from the book, interpreting the scripture, and praying together. Meaning that it never stopped. There was ten of them that took shifts. They poured their life into trying to understand what the word meant. How many people today even read his word? How many people today even read it? But these guys are studying it diligently searching out the things of God. The church today does not do that. Therefore, they walk in the error of the Babylonian system that we live in. They don't search the Scriptures daily to find out what it is that God is saying. Right? Like Timothy. Paul told young Timothy, you know, uh, um, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman. A workman at what? Studying his word. A workman who needeth not to be ashamed. Ashamed at what? Ashamed at his coming. That you're not deceived. Watch this. The instructor of the community had the duty to teach them to seek God with all of their heart and with all of their soul to do that which is good and upright before him. Just as the commandment through Moses and all his servants, the prophets. This is written. His job was to teach them to search it out with diligence to see. I mean, do you realize that if you never, if you just take what you think you know at face value and saying, oh yeah, come on Lord, come on Lord, and one day you stand before him, and you really don't know anything other than what you have been taught. I mean, you didn't look at it for yourself. You didn't study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing what's true and what's not, or correctly handling God's word is the interpreta interpretation. The interpretation is to correctly handle the word of God. How do we correctly handle it? Didn't Peter say some things that Paul say are hard that, that you don't understand? Yeah. That some wrestle with as they do the other scriptures unto their destruction. 2 Peter chapter 3. 
It says, one comes to appreciate that they were exceeding by knowledgeable, one comes to appreciate that they were exceedingly knowledgeable and careful readers of the text. Are you a careful reader of God's Word? Do you read it carefully? Do you examine it to pull out what it is that is actually being said? All of which was for them a unified statement of divine will and plan. That plan hasn't changed. You are still supposed to study that Bible earnestly if you can. Study the things that is written in there. Watch this. I wrote, Knowledge is for the external man. Understanding is for the children of God, the internal man. And wisdom is a result of having the true teacher, the Holy Spirit. Because He is the only one that can interpret the Word of God to you. Do you realize that? The Holy Spirit was sent as the true interpreter of God's Word. How do we know that? Because it says, He, the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKadosh, the wind, will lead you and guide you into all truth. And unless He gives you eyes to see and ears to hear, well then, you'll never see and hear. You'll continually search the goo, the Google, to tell you what's right and what's wrong. You can go to the black goo if you want. But I guarantee you, the goo won't never lead you to Jesus Christ. Man, go to the tree. Continued study of the scriptural laws produced new insights for the community. Wow. In sights. You see, the world will show you what's on the outside, but the Spirit will show you what's on the inside of the letter. With all the knowledge of the world, they tried to interpret the Word of God, but they couldn't because the Holy Spirit hadn't come yet. So when the Spirit came, then they got the insight to really what the letter of the law was saying. It was saying Jesus. Watch this. And the Spirit is the only one that can give you the sight to look within. Um, continual study of the scriptural laws produce new insights for the community. That's my job. My job is to show you what I show you every week. I need to study the Word to continually give you new insights to the Word of God. Right? Because this is the, co the community. Insights that Israel lacked, that the rest of Israel lacked, because they don't even read the Word. There is an implication of regarding the teacher. This is crazy. This is Charlene's lesson I'm reading to you from last week, which is my lesson this week, which is crazy how the Spirit works. It says, this is the implication of the regarding of the teacher. There's only one teacher, the Bible says. The Holy Spirit. Amen. The true teacher. As an inspired interpreter. Well, that's the Holy Spirit. And the law required the help of divinely guided eyeglasses. Wow. Who's the divinely guided eyeglasses? The Holy Spirit. He's the one that gives insight. Put on your spiritual glasses and look, because you can't see it with the natural eyes. That's why when I begin to decode things that the world is showing, and I try to show people, they think I'm crazy. Well, they don't have their glasses on. They don't have the Holy Spirit. They can't see and they think it's rubbish. crazy. 
she's got exegesis here, which is, I wrote just eyeglasses above it, but this to see. To enable members to be able to discover the correct interpretation of what the Word is actually saying. Only the Spirit of God can do that. You can't give anybody else your Holy Spirit, your eyeglasses, because if you try to tell them and show them, oh, you crazy. But when you really get in depth and you start to look, I mean, there's two worlds. The world that people live in today is this world. I don't live in this world. I live in the world you can't see because that's the one that's eternal. That's the one that is, yeah, my physical body is here, but, you know, it's like faith. You can't see it, but you, you have it. And we know that the enemy is all around us and he's trying to do one thing, take us away from the truth. In fact, there's so much knowledge that's being, that is coming forth now. The Bible says in the last days, knowledge would, would increase. There would be a knowledge explosion. And now, you know, we're so buried in lies, the truth is coming forward that the people's unswallowed the lie, they can't even accept the truth. When it's, when it's taken and put right in their face and say, hey, look, this is it. No, mm -mm. no, you crazy. Okay, okay. So, and remember, we can't change people. Only the Spirit of God can. Um, it says that uh, this process involved searching in the law, an activity not practiced by the sex opponents. Wow. Watch this now. Um, and the law required the help of a divinely guided exegesis exegesis, which I call eyeglasses, to enable members to discern the correct interpretation. This process involved searching in the law, an activity not practiced by the sex opponents. You know, that's a perfect example because Satan is a master of the law. And his opponents, which is you and me, well, this kind of his opponents, um, and this is an activity not practiced by the sex opponents. Opponents. Well, that would be you and me. Satan knows the Word of God better than you and I. Are you part of the sect that is not studying to show yourself approved? Because if you're not, well then, you'll be led away and you'll think you're going straight to where... I think you're going to heaven. And little do you know, you're blind. You're walking in a ditch and you think you're on a straight and narrow. How long do you think you can get away with not reading the Word of God? How long do you think you can get away, you know, not studying to show yourself approved unto God? It is your do job to show yourself approved, not to me, not to him. God wants you to show yourself approved unto him. Amen. Show me what you did while you was down there. Did you study my word? Oh no, I didn't think it was that important. Well, that's your road map out of here. And our adversary, the devil, knows it better than us. And that is a fact. Watch. Hence, because the sex opponents didn't practice and study the Word, they did not have the correct views. Why are there so many views of the Word today? Because it's not studied. They've been taught, they've been raised in their tradition. I was a Pentecostal, my father was a Pentecostal, he's a Pentecostal, my mother was a Lutheran, my dad was a Lutheran, I'm a Lutheran. You can be anything you want to be. So that's why I go to church. 
and I'm a Lutheran, or I'm a Catholic, or I'm Episcopalian, or I'm a Baptist. I mean, come on, Paul said, I mean, is one of Apollos, is one of Barnabas, and one of Paul? Are we not all of Jesus Christ? Why are we so worried about placing names and not naming the name above all names, Jesus Christ? You know why? Because they're not studying. The church today does not study. The called out ones who think, you know, there's only a remnant. And the remnant that dives in and exposes the stuff, the church calls them crazy. And that we're being judged by people who doesn't even know the Word of God. How can you judge someone and say this is either right or wrong when you haven't even read it for yourself? Oh, but I know the Word. I was taught it. My papa, my, my daddy, my mama, she read the Bible every day. But what does that have to do with you? Nothing. 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 And the deception is going to get worse. Do you realize the Bible says in Matthew 24 that in the end times that God is going to send great delusion in the world? Right. You know, I just watched a debate from 1972. An atheist proving to the world that the Bible was false. You know how he did it? Let me tell you how the atheist proved it. How the Bible wasn't true. From 1972. In 1972, the atheist said, I'll prove to you beyond the shadow of a doubt the Bible's false. It ain't correct. Huh. Let's see, 1972. In 1969, NASA went on their first mission to the moon. And he said, and NASA went up to the moon and, and shows us a picture of the earth. And clearly... And clearly, the earth is a globe, but the Bible is a flat earth book. And then he begins to give like 10 scriptures showing that the Bible is a flat earth book. And God sits in the throne in heaven looking down on a flat earth. Truly, there could be no God. Because NASA said the earth is a globe. An atheist. God used for today to prove the word of God. So who do you believe? NASA with the big forked tongue? Second Thessalonians says... Test everything right. to this, to this. Let's see, it's got a scripture. How do we know? Knowledge will be increased in the end. Who shows us? Who gives us the true discernment? Well, it's the Holy Spirit. Let's see, let me go to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. And I begin reading. Because, man, I really wanted to understand, you know, what's going on. Is it a possibility we live in so much deception today that we could believe we're traveling through the galaxy. The earth is spinning at 1,000 miles an hour, going around the sun at 10,000 miles an hour, shooting through the galaxy at 67,000 miles an hour, going into wherever. Well, that opens up a whole plane of things that are out there that they could be other planets and aliens on other planets and all of these things that one day can come back. But if the Bible is true... And the earth is flat. And there is a dome over the top of it. Well, then there's a God. And he's sitting on a throne. And you're going to have to face him. There is nothing else. The Bible teaches nothing about planets. Nothing. Yet he speaks of Orion and Pleiades. And he sets the stars within Within, within his dome. Right? What they called it in Genesis? 
the firmament, the dome, the stars, and the sun and the moon are within the dome, the firmament. And they encircle the earth. Is that crazy? Well, the deception can be really, really great if you believe that we're on a globe that we've been taught from children. So that opens up the idea that now we can have other planets with other life. Uh, not according to this. We're God's greatest creation. He cast Lucifer out of heaven to earth, the Bible says. And he is not allowed to go back to where God is. That's right. So now, let's read. Because it says in Isaiah 40, let's start in verse 12. Watch this. He's talking about creation, Isaiah is. Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? And meted, meaning measured out the heavens with the span of his hand. And comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure. Weighed with the, and weighed the mountains in his scales in the hills in a balance. Who hath directed the Spirit of the Lord? Here's the Holy Spirit. Or being his counselor hath taught him. Wow. With whom, with whom took he counsel? And who instructed him? And taught him in the path of judgment. And taught him knowledge. And showed him the way of understanding. Behold, the nations are as a drop in a bucket. Wow. The nations are as a drop inside of a bucket. Huh? And counted as small dust in a balance. Behold. He taketh up the isles as a very little thing. And Lebanon is not sufficient to, to burn, nor the beast thereof sufficient for a burnt offering. Why? Because in Lebanon is where the sons of God came down on Mount Hermon. Intermingled. Can't use them for burnt offerings. It's deep, right? Watch. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted to him less than nothing and vanity. To whom then will ye liken God? Or what likeness will ye compare him? The, work, the workman melteth a graven image, and a goldsmith spreadeth it over with gold, and casteth, casteth silver chains. He that is so impoverished that he hath no oblation has cho chosen a tree that will not rot. He seeketh unto him a cunning workman to prepare a graven image that shall not be moved. Watch this. Have ye not known? Have ye not heard? Hath it not been told you from the beginning? Have ye not understood from the foundations of the earth? Well, the earth has a foundation, the Bible says, about 20 times, and it does not move. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof or as grasshoppers that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as, as a tent to dwell in. You know that word in circle right there? It's not the Hebrew word for globe. 
it's the word, it's the Hebrew word. And, you know, this ain't, this is not the way I wanted to go today at all. Watch this. It's crazy, crazy, crazy. Oh, my Lord, I got so many notes. Huh? Yeah, I see it. Lord, where I wrote it. Oh, here. Oh, here it is. It says that um, it's the word. <laughs> Check, this is like crazy. Really crazy. In Isaiah chapter 40, in verse 22, but I read the whole thing. Um, the Holy Spirit, it says, reveals the things of God in, in Isaiah chapter 40. The word circle is actually um, from the Hebrew word hug, H-U-G. Hug, to wrap around like this. You understand? Watch this. He says it means to hug, a circle, a circle. A circuit, a compass. Wow, a compass is flat. It's not a round ball, right? To encircle, to be compassed with. So here, he's talking about God sitting on his throne above the earth that he's encircled on top of the firmament of the dome. Now watch this. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The Holy Spirit is the one that illuminates the mind. There's a false illumination versus a true illumination. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He says... Chapter 2, and I'm going to start reading. Now, Paul is trying to give them an understanding of God's Word because Paul understands it, and it's only by His Spirit that he can do this. Listen to this. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. So he wasn't using knowledge. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. Watch. But in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power. What does that mean? Paul was giving, him, giving them the understanding of the Word of God. What they have been looking for forever. Thinking they know, look, I didn't come here to give you the Greek, the, the, all the knowledge about this and that. No, I'm coming to you with the power of the Holy Spirit, giving you the revelation of what it truly is. Watch. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, his knowledge, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. How be it? We speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of the world, nor the princes of this world that have come to naught, but we speak of the wisdom of God in a mystery. So the wisdom of God, the word of God, was concealed in a mystery. 
And the only one that can reveal that is the power of the Holy Spirit. And he says, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. And had they had known it, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. Next thing. But as it is written... Now, let's... Now, let's look at this scripture... The next scripture, I have not seen, nor he has heard the things that God has laid up in heaven for us. Is that right? Let's read it now. Paul is not talking about your gifts in heaven. Let's see what he's talking about. Watch this. You've got the context of the mystery of the revelation. It was Jesus Christ. Look what he says. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. That was the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the earth, which none of the princes of this world knew. That's the angels and all of them. And, um, for had they had known it, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen nor has ear heard in the old covenant. Neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love Him. What is that? Jesus Christ. Amen. How many times have we read that scripture and think, I hath not seen or ears heard the things that God has got laid up in heaven for us and we can't wait to get up there to get it. Wrong. El wrongo. The mystery, the promise, and the gift of the ages is Jesus. What's heaven with no Jesus? And you see, I have not seen. You know what I can't see? Because it doesn't have the Spirit. Because the Spirit is the one that gives insight to truth. And if you don't have the Spirit, well then, you don't have insight. The only thing you can see is what's on the outside. And I need to stop. Golly. Oh, it's 12.07. Give me 10 more minutes, please. Next scripture. It says, and this is, uh, I had to get to Joe's scripture. Ephesians chapter 1. Go to Ephesians 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Because, boy, I tell you what, when you start getting into the Word and the Holy Spirit starts pouring on the revelation and showing you, it's like, and you try to come and reveal it to others. Um, and it doesn't mean anything to others. It's, it's man, it, it's... I wish I can just flip a light switch on in people's heads sometime. Amen. And this is uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. But I can't just go to 16 and 17. It's not going to happen. Because you need to hear the Scripture. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. A lot of preachers today is not preaching by the will of God. They're preaching by the will of themselves. Therefore, they're not preaching the Word of God. It says, uh, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be unto you in peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Wow, that's spiritual gifts. In heavenly places in Christ. That's not gifts pertaining to this world. Oh, God gave me this million dollar mansion. Wrong God. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, whom he foreknew, he predestined. God knows the end from the beginning, so he knows who makes it and who doesn't. 
according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise and glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted and beloved, that's through Jesus Christ, and whom we have redemption through His blood, Jesus Christ. Uh, this is Paul pe preaching Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That is it. And the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Wow. I don't care how much sin you've done. His grace will go further. He'll forgive you. Wherein He hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and understanding. He's given us wisdom and understanding, Paul saying. Having made known unto us the mystery of His will. Wow. According to His good pleasure, which He hath purposed in Himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in Him. The dispensation of time is Jesus Christ had an appointed time to come. Right? That's what it means. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of Him who worketh all things after the counsel of His own will, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. That inheritance is Jesus Christ. That we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ. In whom? Joe, here you come. This is Joe loves this. In whom ye also trusted. After that ye have heard the word of truth. The gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that ye have heard the gospel and you believed it. You were sealed. Confirmed. With that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance. The redemption of the purchased possession, which is the earnest of our inheritance. The earnest, the most important thing of the gifts that God has given you is the down payment of His Spirit. Amen. Because without the Holy Spirit, you will go to a place you don't want to go. You know why? Because He's the eyeglasses. He's the one that leads you in all truth. He's the one that leads you down the road. He's the one that now leads you and guides you. And that's why he says, don't grieve him. Yeah. If you don't have the eyeglasses, the most important... It, it, you know, remember that movie that was put out in the 1980s, I think it was? They see. And I'm going to stop. This is, that's, I'm going to stop right there with this. They see. Remember that? Yeah, it was when the guy, it was that wrestler, Rowdy Roddy Piper played the part. Them? No, they see. It was one. They see. They live. Or they see. They live. Now watch. The Holy Spirit, the exogesis, the eyeglasses. That's the one that enlightens you, that you can see. In this movie, they see. The only way you can see the reality of what's out there is by putting on the glasses but as soon as you take them off they look like it looks regular you think that movie was made by accident I don't think so you see the Holy Spirit is the exogesis he is the eyeglasses he is the, he is the gift that was given to you and me so that we can see so that we can see in the name of the movie, if you haven't seen it, you need to see it. It's called They Live. And it's corny and it's great. 
And it's, it, yeah. But you know what? When you get down to the reality of it, you find out that... And let me tell you something. And let me tell you how important the Holy Spirit is to you and me. That unless... Unless... Can I use these for a second? <clears throat> unless you put on the exogenesis, the exogesis of the Holy Spirit, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, when you're reading this, well, you can't see. And you're blind. Because He is the only one that can illuminate you. The true illumination. It's the Holy Spirit that gives us the illumination of the Word of God. And that's why when the Lord, that's why when the Lord began to reveal to me, you know, and I was going crazy about restoring the hearing and, and then just all the stuff, it was because, man, it's like being plugged in. And all of a sudden, it's like a new set of eyes comes out. And you're like, oh my God, son. You're looking at it through the eyes of in which the Word of God was written. Right. It was written by the it was written by the hand of God through the eyes of God by the Spirit of God upon men. Right. Do you know what another name for the Holy Spirit is? What? And I've never heard of it before until about two days ago. The finger of God. The there you go. That's right. Oh, yeah. The finger of God. You'll never come across that. That's right. That's why Jesus, you know, the Spirit told, a, told him to show the Pharisees and Sadducees when they was going to, you know, show them the finger. <laughs> you know, that's where it originated from. But, it's one of the but it wasn't the middle finger. It was the prophet <laughs> finger. Show them the Word and what the Word says, right? It's good stuff. Look, we're going to continue, you know, a lot of stuff we talk about is hard. It's deep. And, um, but we're going to continue on uh, the Holy Spirit. There was some other scriptures. I'm going to give them to you. You can write them down if you want. Um, the scriptures I had today was 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. I like to read from the beginning. 1 Corinthians 2, uh, 12 and 13. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. It's always good to read into it. Um, Isaiah chapter 40. I got verse 13 and 14 where the Spirit reveals the things of God. But I really hit on 22. And then um, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, oh, uh, 10 and 13. Oh, well, I wrote that one already. Let's see. And, um, and I think that's it. So uh, this is about the Holy Spirit being the teacher. The, the true illuminator of the mind. And, um, you know, that was our earnest deposit. That is a measure of the Spirit that was given unto us. You realize that? To Jesus Christ, the Spirit was given without measure. The earnest deposit, that earnest deposit is God said, when you accept my Son, I'm going to give you a gift. I'm going to give you my eyes. I'm going to give you my eyes. Wow. Father, you're so good. Amen. And I pray, I pray, Father, that everyone in here, Lord, I understand why you said, now those who have ears to hear and eyes to see, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would give us your eyes, Father. The eyes of your spirit so that we can see, Lord, especially... Lord, uh, the enemy and the deception of what he's, you know, trying to do to us today, Lord. Deceive us. But if we have the eyes of the Holy Spirit, he can't deceive us. Because the only power he has, your word says, is the power of the word, the law. He uses, tries to use the law against us. And then he tries to change it and flip it and do all kind of crazy stuff. But if we have the Spirit... He's the one that leads us and guides us unto all truth. So, Father, I pray that each and every one of us in here, Lord, give us your eyes, Father. Give us your eyes, Lord. And I know that I received the earnest deposit of the Holy Spirit because according to what Paul said, 
that the only thing that he ministered was Jesus Christ and him crucified and all the things you've showed me from the beginning was all about Jesus Christ and him crucified. But also, Lord, the Holy Spirit reveals Jesus to us. But also your word says, Father, that your spirit, your eyes will reveal unto us things to come. That you would, if it were possible, if it were possible, even the very elect would be deceived. Well, it's very possible for the elect to be deceived if they don't have your eyes, your spirit, Lord. But if we have your spirit, your Holy Spirit living in us, Lord, we won't be deceived. So, Father, I pray, give us eyes to see and ears to hear. In the name of Yeshua, Jesus, amen. Amen and amen. Job 42.5. Hold on. Job 42.5. Job, Job 42.5. I have heard of you only by the hearing of the ear, but now my spiritual with my but now my spiritual eyes see you. Wow. Wow. Faith comes by hearing the word of God, right? Check it out. Faith comes by hearing, you respond, you get your eyeballs, you get your new eyes. That is that's awesome, girl. 42-5. I'm writing that one down.